Hi everybody, welcome to another Glad You Asked. Is it okay to eat crispy pork belly? The question alone is making me drool. Uh, it may seem like a bit of a silly question to ask, but actually it's a, a question that opens up a whole bunch of questions that are really important for us to grapple with. It's a question that helps us to read our Bibles responsibly. So we're going to think a little bit about this question, and spoiler alert, the answer at the end of it is yes. So take a big sigh of relief, and uh, let's get to trying to answer the question. Now, the question as to what we may eat, what we may not eat, is really something that comes out of the Old Testament. As we read our Old Testaments, we realize that there are a whole bunch of dietary laws that God gives his people. Uh, amongst all the other laws that God gave to Israel, uh, that sort of define them, that set the boundaries for who they were and their relationship with him, we have a whole bunch of these dietary requirements and regulations. And some of them are very st uh, strict and, and, and unusual, and they kind of make us wonder why on earth God put them in place. So there were certain things that uh, Israel were not allowed to eat. And for thousands of years, this kind of defined them and their relationship with God and how they interacted with him and how they interacted with the nations around them. Amongst other things... They weren't allowed to eat pork. No bacon, no gammon, no crispy pork belly. Leviticus chapter 11 is one of the places you can go to read about this. So let me read a section from Leviticus chapter 11, and you'll see what I mean. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Say to the Israelites, of all the animals that live on the land, these are the ones that you may eat. You may eat any animal that has divided hoof and that chews the cud. There are, some only, there are some that only chew the cud or only have a divided hoof, but you must not eat them. The camel, though it chews its cud, does not have a divided hoof. It's ceremonially unclean for you. The hyrax, that's the dasi, uh, though it chews the cud, does not have a divided hoof. It is unclean for you. The rabbit, though it chews the cud, does not have a divided hoof. It is unclean for you. The pig, though it has a divided hoof, does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. You must not eat their meat or touch their carcasses. They are unclean for you. And it goes on to list many other animals that you may not eat as an Israelite, including uh, crayfish and gecko and eagle, of all things. And I guess the question is, why? W was there something particularly wrong with these animals that made them off limits for God's people? The suggestion has been made that um, maybe God was protecting them from some kind of health scare. I mean, this is a world without refrigeration. And so maybe God was kind of singling out those animals that might be dangerous to his people. Now, the problem is that God does away with these dietary regulations, as we'll see in a moment. And he does so uh, way before refrigeration comes into effect, uh, where the situation that Israel were living in is not that dissimilar to when the laws were in place. So, I don't know, does that mean that these foods are no longer dangerous? Or does it mean that he doesn't care about his people as much anymore? No, of course he cares for his people. And of course, health reasons are not what drive these laws uh, and, and put them into effect in the first place. Now, the reason is not a health reason. The reason, as I read Leviticus 11, I hope you picked it up, is a, a religious reason. Uh, the, the word clean and unclean appears over and over again. That's the category that divides animals into what is on limits and what is off limits. And so the animals that are okay to eat are those that are clean. Those that are not okay to eat are those that are unclean. So it's, it's a religious category. It's not a health category. And for Israel, certain animals, certain foods were declared by God to be unclean. Now, the purpose of this no-go list has to do with Israel's holiness. The reason they weren't allowed to eat these things, the reason that some animals were unclean, was an issue about holiness. God wanted to separate Israel out from the rest of the nations around them, not to behave like them, not to think like them, not to eat like them. And so they were set apart to be distinct and to be different. And they weren't allowed to associate or socialize with the pagan nations as well. And God instructs them to do so for their own good. Because he knows that if you associate with someone who, who does not have the same values as you, who thinks differently about God and who behaves differently, eventually they will rub off negatively on you. And so God was protecting them uh, against being affected by the evil practices and behaviors of the surrounding nation. And one of the ways that marked them out as different from the surrounding nations was their diet. God gives them these restrictive dietary laws in order to protect them. It's very hard to socialize with people when you can't eat with them, right? 
Now, why God chose particular animals and not other animals isn't so clear, and lots of suggestions have been made. It could have something to do with the kind of food the pagan nations ate and enjoyed, and so God restricts those. Interestingly, it does seem to have something to do with the amount of physical contact a particular animal has with its surroundings. So, for example, hooves and scales were important in deciding which animals were clean and unclean. Uh, one biblical scholar, his name is Peter Lightheart, always uh, has a lot to say and very interesting on these sorts of things. Uh, here's his little paragraph on, uh, on why God might have broken these animals up into these different groups. So here he says, land animals are clean or unclean depending on their footwear and their eating habits. Sea creatures are clean if they have fins and scales, unclean if they don't. That is, animals are clean or unclean depending on how they relate to their environment, whether to dust or water. Clean animals are the ones who are armored to protect them from the world around them. You can kind of see how this mirrors what God is wanting for Israel to protect them from the world around them. Now the question for us as we think about that crispy pork belly is what's changed and why have things changed? Well, what's changed is that Jesus has come to break down all the dividing walls that once separated people from each other. Jesus has come to fulfill all that God's law was about in himself, to fulfill the law's requirements, and then to offer himself as the only perfectly clean sacrifice, to do away with everything that makes our world and our lives unclean. See, that was Jesus' mission. And the Old Testament system couldn't actually deal with our uncleanness at a heart level, could it? It could only deal with the external. The heart level remained untouched. And so Jesus comes to really bring cleanness, wholeness, cleanness from the inside out, which is what Jesus says to his disciples and to those who listened. Uh, listen, for example, in Mark chapter 7. Mark 7 uh, verse 18. Jesus says, don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. And then there's this incredible comment that relates to what we're talking about. It says, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. All foods clean. See, in Jesus, we're all united together in him, no longer separated by culture and ethnicities, or even food. The Apostle Peter had to learn this, as did the rest of the Apostles in the early days of Christianity, as the Gospel began to move beyond just Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth into Gentile and pagan territory. And so a man like Cornelius gets converted. He's a, Jew, uh, he, he's a Gentile, rather. And Peter doesn't quite know what to do with this, because the old regulations say you can't hang out with Gentiles, surely? So Peter gets given this vision by God to help clear things up, and we read about it in Acts chapter 10. Let me read a little excerpt. In Acts chapter 10, Peter saw heaven open and something like a large sheep being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals. And then a, a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Can you see that the food laws weren't actually about food? Food was just one of the ways that God was separating his people from everyone else. The food laws were actually about who was acceptable in God's sight. And so when Peter arrives at Cornelius' house a little bit later in Acts chapter 10, he concludes this in verse 34. He says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. God accepts everybody now in Jesus if we, if we will put our trust in him. See, we have to read our Bibles in the light of who Jesus is and what he has done. He has changed everything because he has fulfilled everything. So we're no longer bound by the Old Testament regulations and laws the way Israel were. Now that doesn't mean God has done away with them. Not at all. Uh, those are still God's word to us. They still uh, have much to say about how we are to think about God, how we are to live. But we're not under them in the way Israel were. Food no longer has to separate us from one another. 
But we still, of course, need to be careful about the intention of each of those laws. And so as God's people, he still wants us to be holy. He still wants us to be set apart from the world around us and not to be infiltrated by the values and the behaviors of the world around us. We've still got to do that. We've still got to be careful. But of course, some things have changed in Jesus dramatically, including the food laws. How do you figure out what's changed? This is a difficult one. You say, some people look at Christianity and they say, well, we've just picked and choose which one, which particular laws we want to hold on to and which ones we want to do away with. Well, there's no short answer to this. The, the, the truth is you have to get to know Jesus. You have to listen to what he says. You have to get to know how the gospel transforms our relationship with God. But the one thing we're not free to do is to pick and choose what we want to listen to and what we want to do away with. Jesus may have uh, changed the food laws, for example, but he certainly hasn't changed the way, cha changed the laws that have to do with marriage or to do with sexuality. Right? God's eternal principles still stand. But when it comes to the food laws, we can be free to know that whatever God has given us, we can receive with thanksgiving. We can enjoy so long as we're doing it to the glory of God. Can you eat crispy pork belly? Only if it's done properly, in my opinion. Nothing worse than rubbery pork crackling, right? But of course we can. God has given all good things to enjoy. And in Jesus, we have freedom that we didn't have as Israelites under the old system. That's a reason to give, God's praise, don't, give God praise, don't you think? That's a reason to, to thank him for the freedom that we have in Christ, but not to abuse it. Always to bear in mind the intention of what God's law was. Well, I hope that's helped, and I hope that you enjoy your your. Uh, bacon, your pork belly, whatever it is that you enjoy, and do it to the glory of God.